Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. God bless you, Pastor David Trainum, coming to your heart, your life, your car, your home, wherever you're listening to this broadcast at once again, thanking you for tuning in. In a couple of seconds, I'm going to continue the message that I started last week as we began to talk about the system of racism the system of racism. Now, um, as I said, not all blacks are racist, not all whites are racist. However, there is a system in place that um, is there to keep people of color specifically from advancing their lives as the constitution says we're supposed to. And so that's what I'm revealing here. And also I'm going to give you a few keys along the way to help you navigate those negatives. Okay, and so without further ado, let's get right into the word of the Lord today. You know, if you remember last time, um, as we ended, we talked about things that are uh, that were on paper. And I went back, you know, probably to the 50s, the 60s, when African-Americans um, were getting their freedoms and their rights and laws were forced, you know, uh, forced the country to include them in the um the economics that were available. And although laws were set on paper, they were not enforced because there was no accountability and oversight and bankers and realtors still did whatever they wanted to do. And although, you know, those things began to change, by the time they were changed, the laws were uh, enforced in a way, and I, I should say they were structured in a way that kept African Americans from accomplishing the American dream because it was systemic. It was a system that was set up. And so not having the opportunity to be homeowners, if you remember last week, one of the things I said was that, you know, a, a, a property is one of the things that helps us create generational wealth you know, but not having the opportunity to be homeowners in a geographical area that was designed to allow whites to increase their value. It keeps African-Americans and others, you know, at a economic disadvantage. And the fact is, if we don't own property outright, we're going to be putting our money into bags with holes in them. And the reason housing, especially home ownership, was and remains so important is because real estate always increases in value. And it's not that it'll go up millions of dollars overnight, although we've seen some people make millions of dollars in one transaction. You know, that's not the norm. It, it, it increases incrementally. And so in order for you to have generational wealth, you have to get in on it and then allow the process of time to push the value of your property up so that your children and your grandchildren can have an inheritance that's going to help them build on the economics that the Constitution is supposed to afford us. And you must understand that getting a mortgage on a property is only the beginning of the reversal of, proper, of, of poverty. We still got to have wisdom. We've got to make certain that the property is maintained. We've got to make certain that the mortgage is paid off as quickly as it can be paid off so that, you know, we're not going to our graves, especially as we go into our, our senior years. You don't want to necessarily go into your senior years and you've got this great big massive mortgage and you have to work your fingers to the bone just to stay in your house. Therefore, getting a mortgage on the property, it's only the beginning of the reversal of poverty. Now, in addressing racism within the system, people must first acknowledge that racism exists. Now, most African-Americans, we will say that we know it exists because you know, we've experienced it. And I, I got to say this, there are some times, you know, uh, there, there are times when some people of color Say uh, says that something is racist when it's actually not. It's not a racist thing. Sometimes it's somebody operating in ignorance. And people would say, you know, well, the two are the same. And, and I beg to differ. Somebody that's in ignorance, they're operating in a way in which their understanding about something has not been influenced. 
a person that's racist, they're operating in a way in which they know what they're doing. And they are not willing to change what they think about it. And so me being raised in the North, I didn't recognize the subtleties of racism because I was able to get an education, to get a good paying job, to go freely about the country without the fear of being lynched or killed. I didn't know that this was not the fate of all African-Americans. I was treated well by most Black people. I was treated well by some white people. And I was afforded that education. Even uh, the owner of a business that I, I worked for when I was a kid, he invited me over for dinner with his wife and family when I was 16 years old. One of our local priests, uh, 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 Father Peter Young, he would go out of his way to assist our family and other Blacks, you know, in the south end of Albany and then around the region and around the state in any way that he could. I thank God for people like him who set an example of what it meant to live an unselfish life. Now, it should have been a red flag for me to see the poverty in the South End, but because that's where I was born, that's where I was raised, looking at poverty, it was the norm. Looking at limited housing opportunities, the marches for justice, the murders of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, and John and Robert Kennedy, who are in support of black justice, it didn't click. And I've come to understand that just because I'm not directly affected by something, it does not mean that it does not exist. And by the same token, not being directly affected means that I am indirectly affected. Therefore, I must approach life with an open mind. I must hear what those who are being oppressed are saying and do what I can to make life better. And I may not be able to change every law, every policy, and I may not be able to alleviate all the stress and heartache that people go through. However, if I do my part within my sphere of authority. I may help somebody. I may make greater long-term change than I would if I did nothing at all. And I found out when I married my Mississippi bride that during this same time period, people in the South were fighting for equal rights, fighting for better paying jobs. They were being denied mortgages on a larger scale still being integrated into an educational system. They were being turned down by colleges and universities. And besides that, they were being lynched and murdered. And now you got to understand, this wasn't the 40s and 50s. This was the 60s and the 70s. In the North, the hatred was not as evident. Therefore, we didn't fight as hard. But it does not mean that we were not affected by the sting of racism. And some people did not fight at all. And because my life was better, it appeared that I accepted my life and lifestyle as a norm. And I was ignorant of the fact that justice, that I should say injustice, affected so many more people. I didn't realize that, you know, when I went to a summer school back in the ninth grade, you know, I, I had to go to summer school to take a course. And I, and I didn't go to the Albany High. That was the place where they had the uh, summer school lessons. I, my parents wouldn't let me go there. They wanted me to go to another place so that I would focus on my study and not so much be influenced by my friends. And again, not their fault. That was my fault. And so I went to, it was the old Vincentian Institute. And I did not look at somebody almost on a daily basis. And if not daily, and it was only a, I think it was a five week summer school course. It was definitely two times a week, maybe uh, once a month, at least once a month. The guy would look across, this is another student, and he would say something, not something to the effect, but he would say specifically, hey, man, where'd you get that tan? And understand, 
that may not seem like a big thing. But when something that somebody says affects you, that needs to be considered by the person who is saying it. Another example. Back in the maybe early 2000s or so, I served on a, a board. It was a Christian board. And the vice chairman of that board, we were talking about abortion. And he was talking about the beauty of, you know, black babies. And that's what where the uh, conversation was. And he went outside of, I think, the parameters that should have been set. And he called our African-American babies chocolate babies. I addressed it immediately. I said, sir, you know, with the greatest respect, I said, that statement could be offensive to some, if not many, African-Americans. And instead of him considering and he us even having dialogue around why, he simply defended why he said it. He brought in the fact that Martin Luther King Jr.'s um, niece heard that and thought it was a great statement. And my, my answer to that was, sir, she does not represent the entirety of the African American race. And because that come, we had a little bit of a conversation about that, but there was no movement, there was no repentance, there was no apology. You know, I immediately that night I sent in my letter of resignation and I let them know that I was not going to sit there and tolerate somebody who was blatantly racist who who did not consider what i wanted to uh, uh to uh to say and did not consider what my thoughts were and change how they're going to act with me got to understand some people would say well that's not a bad statement it is when it's coming from somebody of a different color it is when it's uh, when it's uh, being said and people are laughing about it. I would never say that. And so, except for things like that, in the North, hatred was not as evident. Yet because my life was better, it appeared that I accepted my life and lifestyle as the norm. And I must admit, there were always some people in the North that understood the subtleties of racism. My sister-in-law, uh, Ann Pope, she was one of them. And she always fought to make things better. In the 60s, 70s, and 80s, we had advocates in our city, especially in the south end of Albany, in Arbor Hill area of Albany, who saw through the smoke and the mirrors, and they advocated for change and equality for everyone. These are people we don't read about in our history books. Men and women, because it goes beyond, you know, uh, my sister-in-law, there are many. And I can begin to name them and I'll forget somebody, you know, and then somebody might get upset. So I'm just gonna leave it at that. You know, there are people who stood in the face of denial and outright prejudice here in Albany. And they would not flinch as they deemed that freedom, you know, that everybody should enjoy as a reward that was worth their own sacrifice. And if people do not recognize systemic racism, and if they do not admit that it's a present reality, they will not try to change attitudes and behaviors that proliferate the wrong that's been done since America was taken away from the Indian nation and especially since the enslavement of blacks here in the United States of America. You see, systemic racism is real. And, and, and I'm going to say this. You know, people, many people, I should say, 
within our African-American culture and our race here in Albany, they don't understand what I'm advocating for. And I'm not trying to justify what I'm doing. I'm not trying to justify the relationships that I'm building. But you know something? One thing that I have is a clear conscience where I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, I'm not doing it for me. I'm 70 years old almost. You know, I just turned 69. And you know something? I could just very well sit back like so many others who have run their race and they're finishing their course and sit back and, and just watch, you know, uh, uh, YouTube all day long. But I refuse to do that because I see a system that God has set me in that ha that has also begun to respect who I am. And because of that, I'm using the respect that some people have given me to sit at tables, especially within law enforcement, and try to make change that's going to be better for all of us. Because somebody doesn't understand it, it doesn't mean that I'm going to stop. Because somebody talks about me behind closed doors, I'm not going to stop. Because somebody would say, well, you know, uh, Pastor Dave, I think he sold out. You don't know me. But the people who know me, they understand what I'm trying to do. And so we come to the place where we understand that racism is woven into the fabric of the nation. And what we have done is we have learned to accept a biased system and settle on the erroneous fact that some things just weren't supposed to be. Now notice, that's an erroneous fact. It's not the truth. However, the United States of America is supposed to be the land of opportunity for all people. And therefore, we must make systemic changes that's going to level the playing field and give African Americans and other people of color. They call it the BIPOC, the you know, uh, BIPOC race, black, indigenous, and people of color, a fighting chance at living the dream that we have been told is available for us. Now, as I end. Although we're excited and we celebrate people from other nationalities who migrate to America and they succeed immensely, many times we're also disheartened when we are denied under the identical laws that they're operating and the identical policies of our nation because we do not have the same rights and privileges. See, operating within the system our entire lives, we've accepted what's wrong as being just and fair. We adjust our lives to make the most of a system that's been stacked against us. And we do everything we can to make certain that we survive, making our lives the best that they can be using the hand that has been dealt to us. That's what your parents did. It's not that some of them didn't want to fight. They just made the best with the hand that they were given. Some of them worked so hard, they didn't have time to fight. My father, he worked four jobs at times. He had his full-time job, and throughout the week, he had three other part-time jobs at times. They didn't have the time to make it work. They came. You got to understand, when I talk about my dad, I'm talking about somebody that was born in 1930. He came from the the the, uh, the area of Virginia, Crystal Hills, Halifax County. He came from that area. In that area back then, it was filled with racism. And so we understood, or I should say he understood, that the system was stacked against him. And he had what I refer to oftentimes as a survival mentality. But it's a survival mentality that often keeps you living below your potential. Because you see small incremental adva advances that lack the power to change the narrative of your life. You see, your life is spent making a living or making ends meet, just like our parents did. 
but they neglect to make the life that our children and grandchildren can enjoy long after they live, they leave this earth. You see, and 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 people can live however they want, but you gotta understand having a brand new car is not the greatest statement of prosperity, especially when you have payments on that car. And I'm not, I'm not against it. I need a car, you see, and I'm going to have another car, but I am not going to let that be my goal in life just so I can keep up with the Joneses. A lot of times the monies that we spent on a vehicle we could have invested in property. But pastor, how am I going to get around? Uh, uh, you know, understand, that's something you got to figure out. And I'm not saying that you're right or you're wrong. I'm simply saying for me, I've got to make certain that I do not allow a survival mentality to get in. Where all I'm going to do is work for my food and work for the greatest clothes and work for the greatest, uh, the latest electronics. To have the latest car and trade it in every two or three years. And, and I understand, especially for women, sometimes the best thing you can do is have a leased vehicle so that you're safe on the road. But my hope is that eventually you could get to the place where you're not going to have that lease payment every month and you can begin to save money so that you can get into investments and in property. Lastly, because making ends meet takes so much time and effort, oftentimes after we get done working, we have no energy to fight what we've come to know is wrong. Therefore, we settle for the life that we have. We revert to an attitude of acceptance. And after 30 or 40 years in a job that really led nowhere, but it provided, you know, a you with food and clothes and your needs being met, you conclude that it must not have been in the cards for you to excel. But settling on this attitude causes confusion frustration, and jealousy. As you see, people of different races excel, getting the promotions that gives them the higher standard of living so they can qualify for loans and purchase homes and uh, cars. They can take exotic vacations. They can, you know, scale their business without maxing out credit cards and going deeper in debt. And in essence, so they can live the American dream. My friend, again, another portion of this, many YouTube uh, 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 programs and, and videos out there on systemic racism. Again, I'm not trying to touch on every part of it. I'm talking about things that I know have affected my life and most likely your life. And so next week, we're going to pick up talking about racism in every segment of life. Racism in every segment of life, because my friend, racism is woven into most of our society. And I'm not just talking about racism from the perspective of Caucasians, but there's racism from the perspective of African Americans as well. So we're going to start talking about that. And, and 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 there's an underlying thing here. There's also racism in the Christian church. And at some point, I'm going to talk about that. Okay? And so until next week, Pastor David, wishing you the greatest Christmas that you could have ever had. I hope that you experience the joy of this Christmas season, that you understand the sacrifice of God in sending his only begotten son into this earth, declaring that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus was sent into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world. And because of that, I'm born again. And the scripture according to John 10 is that you understand that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. 
But understand, Christ came that you might have life. And so, my friend, until next week, enjoy this season. Enjoy your family. And my friend, don't forget to enjoy your God. God bless you.